the only way that those big material successes even have any value is if you actually have true peace with it. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we have a special guest who has a very interesting background. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this episode. So she was the winner of Project Runway, but she's so much more than that. We talk about manifesting, how she manifested that experience, spirituality, and how spirituality is still encompassing of areas of life that don't feel spiritual, like the TV industry. And then we go into energy healing and breath work. So today's guest is Milana Snow. Milana Snow is one of the leading voices in global wellness. She's an energy healer, teacher, and wellness entrepreneur with a passion for bringing healing to a diverse community of clients, followers, brands, celebrities, and even members of the royal family. Based in Los Angeles, Milana is a former model and woman of color with Afro, Latina, Panamanian, American, and British roots. Speaking to an audience as diverse as her background, her work has appeared in Harper's Bazaar, Pop Sugar, and Well and Good. Milana is the winner of Project Runway and the Best Travel and Adventure Show Webby Award. Hello, Milana. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Good. I'm excited to have you. You're such an interesting person. Like I was like reading your website, checking out your background. I I mean, how do you explain yourself? How do you tell your story to people who who, you know, are just meeting you for the first time? Oh, well that that means a lot coming from you. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, it's really funny whenever somebody asks me like, "So, what do you do? Tell me about yourself." I'm like, you know, it's a pretty non-traditional story. <laughs> That's yeah. usually how I start. You're like, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, I don't know. It's. Um, I think. I think one of the things that's really interesting about my path and that's very unique that started from a very very young age is that I have many. Di- I'm like the intersection of many different worlds. I'm mixed. I ha- I'm half Panamanian, um, half white American, African American. All of all of that, and that has a lot of its own implications. I also grew up all over the U.S. I never lived longer than four years in any house. Wow. Um, and and there's just a lot of different things that kind of ha- transpired that were very unique. But one of them being that I started meditating when I was four years old, and so. I often try to share that in the early stages of who am I, because it definitely informs everything else. Okay. And who taught you to meditate at that young age? (laughs) (laughs) My grandma. It's a really funny story. She basically, she is a hippie. She always was a hippie. And one day when I was really, really young, four years old, she had me lay next to her during nap time and said, okay, you're going to close your eyes and you're going to step out of your body. Ooh. And when you're four years old, you just go, okay. Yeah. And she literally taught me how to astral project and have spiritual oh uh, meditative experiences in that exact way. So you're saying she already have has been practicing that. She had that gift to do that. She did. She did. Okay. She'd been doing it since she was a little girl. And wow. I was just wide open when she wanted to share it with me. Okay. So basically you've always kind of been in touch with like the spiritual and otherworldly. Yeah. I have to say it's, it's been kind of the through line of my entire life. And, and I have to say, like, as we'll probably talk about later, you know, there's definitely been, I I wasn't like raised and, and lived in an ashram my whole life. Like I was a model in New York. I used to party for, you know, 15 hours at a time. I mean, (laughs) I definitely had like a, a very like living kind of life as growing up, but that was always something that I personally practiced privately until about 10 years ago. Wow. Yeah. So I, cause I do know about your journey. You started out as a model, you got on project runway. And so was this side of you, the energy meditative site, was that all a secret or did you share it with the people in your life? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think now that wellness and spirituality is so mainstream now and and so many young people are getting into it, I think people either forget or don't realize that a lot of the things that are very normal were very taboo just oh, yeah. 10, 15 years ago. Yes. So, you know, when I, I, I moved around the country basically a few times a year, at least once a year for most of my childhood. 
And I would find myself in certain parts of the country where, you know, reading tarot cards or the Harris horoscope was considered evil or like Mm -hmm. of the devil. Mm -hmm. So I very quickly, besides the fact that I was like already very much studying spirituality, all the world religions at a very weirdly young age, (laughs) I very quickly realized, okay, this is not something that everybody is open to. And so I really didn't come out of my spiritual closet, as I like to call it, until I was about 24, 25 years old. Okay. And what was the catalyst that made you start opening up? Oh, that's a good question. I would say Project Runway was a huge turning point for me because Project Runway, and I don't know if anybody out there knows this show, but Project Runway at the time, this was 2010, was literally yeah, the biggest show in the show. world. Yeah. It was the biggest show in the world, literally. Um, they had just won seven, seven Emmys the, the season before mine. So it was a massive show to get on. But what was really interesting was, you know, you had you had 17 designers and 17 models, and the models were kind of randomly put with the designers. And everything was random. Like, if your designer got dismissed or they didn't do well on a dress, like, if you were their model, you went home too. Mm-hmm. But the really interesting thing is that this entire experience, despite how big of a deal it was on TV, was a completely spiritual experience for me because before I even auditioned, for the show, a voice, call it God, my inner self, told me that I was going to win Project Runway before I even wow. auditioned. Okay. But yeah. you were planning to audition, right? Like you knew about the show. Um, well, you know, back then, like when you, I mean, I was a model, I was like 23 years old. Uh You basically get a call from your agent. I got a call from my agent. He literally told me of 30 minutes to get to this project runway audition. And I was like, Oh, so it was last minute. Okay. And I literally was like, Oh, okay. Wait, so when, at what point did that voice tell you? Was it before you knew about the audition? Yeah. So I literally got the, the call from my agent. As soon as I hung up, I heard you are the winner of Project Runway. And when I, like for me, I already had a very deep spiritual practice. So for me, I was very clear that that wasn't my voice or that at least wasn't the Milana that was going to the audition. And I literally held my phone up and I was like, God, can I just go to the audition first before you tell me something so crazy? Yeah. Yeah. And sure enough, when I went to the audition, there was a feeling. There was just kind of a, you know, when you like, you kind of have a feeling like something is going to happen. I just Mm -hmm. had that feeling. It was in the air. And when I went home that night, I prayed and I just was like, okay, I am going to assume that if I book this job tomorrow, they're going to let us know the next day. If I book this job tomorrow, that that voice that I heard is real and that my only job is to stay in the vibration of that reality. Mm -hmm. That's my job. Mm -hmm. And the next day I booked it, four months later, I won. That's incredible. (laughs) Wow. I I mean, talk about that. So you're basically, you've gotten to a point where like, once you hear the the voice or the call, you, you know, to align yourself to that reality. Cause most people hear these things and they ignore it. They're like, yes. If you even hear it in the first place. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. I want you to talk about your mindset and kind of, yeah, where were you (laughs) throughout that period? I love that you use the word mindset because I've been saying lately to my team and my clients, I really think that manifestation, that word has been kind of like overused. Mm -hmm. Manifesting is all about mindset and, and it, and it can be a mystical thing. Don't get me wrong, but it is also very logical and simple. My mindset at the time was very open. I had just graduated from college 10 days before I was back in New York city after going home for a couple of weeks. And I was like, I'm ready. I'm ready for anything good and big. Like I was open and I was expectant of really good things to happen for me. And I think that's a really big key thing. Mm -hmm. And my mind had this filter that whatever was coming was going to be really good and really big for my life. Before we go on, I want to take a moment to share about today's sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit, where you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. It's a convenient way to cook at home for yourself or your entire family. Because all the ingredients are pre-measured for you, there's less prep work and less waste when cooking with HelloFresh. I love that the recipes are easy to follow and quick to make. It always feels doable and not overwhelming because at the end of a long 
long day, all I really want is something easy to make. I also like that I'm learning to cook new recipes, so I'm expanding my knowledge and range with cooking. In terms of meals, you can choose from 50 weekly recipe options, including low calorie, vegetarian, and family friendly recipes. Of course, flexibility is really important with our ever changing routines, so with HelloFresh, you can skip weeks when you need to, change your delivery dates, or update your food preferences all in the HelloFresh app. If you're looking to try out HelloFresh, you can go to hellofresh.com slash TLL16 and use the code TLL16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash TLL16 and use the code TLL16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. And I think also something that was really, um, and, and this, by the way, this, this experience has really like informed all of my like big manifestations and wins in my life. So it was a big, it was a big like uh, experiment for me. But I would say the other thing that was really interesting that I've repeated many, many times before was that I was in a, a very deep connection with my own inner guidance. Like I knew that voice. Mm-hmm. I knew that voice wasn't my ego. It was it was something else because my, my ego would be more like, Oh, you're not going to get the audition. Like that would have been the old self that would have listened to that. But because I was meditating, because I was constantly in practice with my yoga, with my spiritual practices, I was kind of attuned to a higher voice than like kind of my trauma or my, Mm -hmm. my lower ego self. I love that. That's amazing. Okay. Now go back because you were telling your story about how Project Runway was the turning point. So what does that mean? Oh, yes. Thank you for bringing (laughs) me back around. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It was a turning point for me because it was kind of where these two worlds had merged. I, as a child, had always meditated, but I always believed that I was supposed to be on television. So there was this really interesting belief before being on Project Runway, that those two things were in conflict. That TV, Uh, film, acting was like not spiritual and like materialistic or whatever. And that my spiritual life was about like literally meditating the Himalayas until mm -hmm. I fully awakened, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So realizing that those two worlds could actually coexist and that they were very much the same thing because I made that mean that and because I allowed myself to see it that way, I was able to have a deeply spiritual experience and what on the outside looked like mega success. Mm -hmm. So here I was at 24, 23, 24, one on the biggest show literally in the world. And also knowing deeply in my heart that I had come into a greater experience that was larger than any television show or any attention that that would get. And so for me, what I realized from that point, what I practice and and try to share as much as possible is that you can have these big successes and breakthroughs and manifestations like your soulmate and your, your dream house or your dream career. And you can also be fully and deeply fulfilled and in touch with something greater and more mm-hmm. meaningful than all of those material things. And both of those mm-hmm. things can happen at the same time. And that, in fact, the only way that those big material successes even have any value is if you actually have true peace with it. And so that's wow. really been the love model it. that I've sought out since. I love that. Because it is true. I think a lot of people detach those two things from each other. Like They think being spiritual means you don't want any material things. You don't care about anything in the real, you know, fame, fortune, all of this, but you're saying you can have both and sometimes they inform each other. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, even just this past weekend, I I went to Coachella and I feel like Coachella has been making like, it's gotten a pretty bad rap. Like, let's be honest. It's not about music anymore. I actually went too, but it is very (laughs) Instagram influencer. Yeah. 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 And, and I realized that there's, there's a, like a real reason why it's gotten a bad rap, but my experience last weekend was actually, I had an amazing synchronistic spiritual experience where Mm -hmm. I had all these amazing conversations and realizations and like oneness moments. And I realized that even in environments like television or being an influencer or or wanting to be something, Mm -hmm. there's still depth and meaning if we actually seek it. I love it because spirituality is all encompassing. It doesn't exclude 
any of yes. these things. Wow. Yes. Amazing. Okay. Um, I mean, is there anything else you want to talk about Project Runway being a spiritual experience? Because I feel like oh, there, yes. there's more to that. Yeah. There's some there's some <laughs> juicy little nuggets there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I, I have to say, so like this, this kind of was like a framework for me. And one of the bigger realizations that I actually remind myself a lot is that when you already know the outcome and you truly believe in the outcome, the vision that you have for yourself, whether that's on your vision board or in your meditations or whatever that is, when you already know that, then you don't have to compete for it. You don't have to fight for it. So there was a really interesting experience that I had, like, you know, there were 17 models on the show. We were all at any moment vulnerable to be dismissed or like never to be seen on the show again if our designer was kicked off the show. But what I saw was really interesting because I decided, okay, if I'm the winner, then that means I don't need to compete. That means that actually I'm a very, I'm very at peace and and happy. And even though I was the underdog because mm-hmm. I was like the the thick, I had the fattest butt or whatever it was, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Like it didn't matter. It didn't matter if my designer or my dress fit or looked great because I knew that I was going to win. So all of those mm-hmm. other details and all of those things to talk about that are negative or kind of or comparative were completely irrelevant and actually would put me in a in a state that would be opposite of being the winner. And it wasn't about thinking I was better. It was actually just accepting what already was. And so what I would see is when, when some of the models on the show would get in arguments with each other or talk badly about each other or say, Oh, I look so horrible. And those would be the ones that would go home. Uh, yeah. So one by one, 16 different women, I could see like, Oh my gosh, like, that girl just got in a fight with her boyfriend and brought it to the set the next day wow. and she went home. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so when I really got to see that over and over again over the course of four months, I realized, understood for myself that when I'm at peace and I'm not comparing myself and I'm just really focused on what my job is, what the assignment is, and that's, and that's my only focus – then everything else just fills in because I'm already at the vibration of that end. I love that. Yeah. I'm, I mean, other question, because it sounds like you were doing everything right. You were at peace. You, you, knew, you already accepted that you're the winner. What if you did not win? Do you feel like you would have just accepted that easily as well? Or do you feel like you were, you know, how that is to, such do a you attach to the question. outcome? Because yeah, you that truly, truly believe that you'd be the winner. That is such a good question. Yeah. You know, it's really funny because... The, the interesting trap with an experience like this is there have been times where I thought something was going to happen and it didn't yeah, after. Yeah. So I can't speak to that experience because I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. In other uh, times. In other, but because other sometimes you try your best to manifest. You're doing everything right and it still doesn't happen in the end. Yeah, maybe you manifested wrong as some people might say. Like what is your take on that? Well, yeah, that's the thing. I don't think – that there is a right or wrong in the first place. I feel like there were times where I doubted whether I was going to win. And there were times, there was actually one day in particular where I was really, really off and I wasn't sure if I was going to get eliminated the next day. And I realized the turning point and what I believe might have kept me from going the other direction was I went home and I was like, every part of me that doubts this end, I have to completely shake that off. I cannot, like any part of me that's afraid that I'm getting disqualified, I have to get rid of it. So what I did, which honestly, if you would have been there, you would have thought I was absolutely insane, was I literally jumped up and down, screamed into a pillow, and I just kept screaming, I'm the winner of Project Runway, I'm the winner of Project Runway, over and over and over again, until I believed it again. Yeah, wow. And, And so I think about some of the times when I had really big opportunities, I mean, even as recently as a couple months ago. There were times where I would let the doubt take hold and that reality would actually like, it it would become stronger than the, than the desire that I had. And I don't, I don't know, all of this is quite mystical. So like, there's so much more beyond what we think and what we know. Right. But I have to say the times where I don't try to control and make something what I want, but actually just believe and open myself up to all the vulnerabilities that come with that and trust that I'm constantly in the flow and that that is the end, 
then those things tend to manifest. But it's when I'm like, should I call this person back and see if they still want to work with me? Should I, should I have my agent check to see if, you know, that when you start getting into that, or did I get the job? Maybe I should send them flowers. That's when I find things don't work out. It's when we're trying instead of Uh just being. Yeah. And the rest is really a mystery. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. That's amazing that you have that experience. And and now I kind of want to move to the later part of your journey because eventually, and you became an energy healer. So, so how did you start doing what you're doing now? Yeah, it, it is a really interesting transition because after Project Runway, my modeling and acting pursuits didn't make sense anymore. I realized that I had to have more meaningful experiences like I did. And um, for about a year after Project Runway, I actually didn't work for a year which was the exact opposite of what I thought was going to happen. And then I was like, what's up, God? Like, I thought I was on a roll now. Like, what's going on? But what was really happening, looking back, is that I was having a totally transformative experience where really I just wanted to do things that mattered to me instead of Mm -hmm. looked great on the outside, which was really tied to my childhood trauma, this like need for validation, need Mm -hmm. to be important, need to be seen and protected. And so when I started to start to face that in the year that followed Project Runway back in 2010, I started to remember that my spirituality was what really made me feel meaningful. And not because other people saw me in that way, but because that was the experience I had within myself. And so I started to, like what I say, come out of my spiritual closet. Like I just started to tell people about what I experienced on Project Runway, how I meditated, what it meant to me. And I started my first company in 2012, which was just rooftop yoga and meditation. And at the time in New York, doing meditation and yoga on rooftops was not normal. Yeah. It was completely like the craziest, coolest ahead idea of the trend. ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was how I started. And it was just really inviting amazing teachers that I practiced with that were my teachers that I looked up to to come and do this event with me. And over over the course of, you know, seven summers, I did that for seven summers, I started to share my practice and develop my personal practice with other people. And Mm -hmm. it really started to take off about, I would say about 10 years ago. Wow. So, so what, how did you learn what you know now? Did you have a bunch of different teachers that you practice from? Or is it kind of something you formulated on your own in connection with the divine or something? I definitely, I definitely have had amazing mentors, but I will say the practice that I share now, which is integrative energy healing, it's a fusion of holotropic breath work and energy healing. I learned on my own, um, holotropic breath work. Have you ever done it before? I've done breath work. I'm not sure if it's called holotropic because I've done it a few times with different teachers. Was it a psychedelic experience? Like did it? Yes. Okay. Like circular okay. breathing, and then you just get emotion. Like I, in the beginning, my hands get cramped up, and yes, okay, lot. you're doing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, done it. I've done it a yeah. few times. It's great. It it, oh. it like blew my mind the first couple times. I'm like, I can't believe my body can do this just by breathing. Yes. That is exactly what I tell people whenever yeah. we do this practice. I'm like, this is just your breath. Yeah. So that's I actually went to a holotropic breathwork session, which is basically it's two inhales in, one exhale out. And it's all through your mouth. And that pattern of breath, when you're guided to do it for at least 5, 10, 15 minutes, takes you into an altered state of consciousness that's similar to taking a psychedelic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, really potent, as you know. And so I did that one time at an event. And I was like, whoa, what is this? And the woman who taught the class said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't teach it. This is just my you know, event. I said, okay, I'm just going to go home and I'm going to practice it. So I practiced it every single day for months, which let me tell you, and I'm sure you know, is like super intense. Yeah. <laughs> every day. <laughs> very intense. It's like yeah. taking you know, some kind of crazy drug every day. It was like very yeah. intense. And um, – And after a few months of doing that and having just like mind blowing realizations and healing, I started sharing it with my energy healing clients who I had, you know, a pretty good practice uh, with at the time. So, so fusing those two things just became this, like my own personal practice, which has always been my work. It's like taking, taking these things that I've learned for, it's been 30 years now and really deeply working on those things with myself and then sharing them with others. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to say like 
when, and I think a lot of healers out there, a lot of therapists, psychologists, a lot of us have been called to be healers or facilitators because we needed it so bad because we need it oh, so yeah. much yeah. ourselves. And so that was definitely the case for me. Love it. So you talked about breath work, but let's go back to energy healing. When you say that, it's, it sounds very vague. What does it really mean? And how, how, do, how does it work? Oh, yeah, that's such a good question. There's definitely a reason why it sounds vague in my vocabulary, because I, I consider energy healing to be a very big umbrella of which many things fall under. And I always say with, to people that energy healing is the same thing as when you receive Reiki or when your mother gives you a pat on the back and says, baby, it's going to be okay. Mm. Like it's this intentional sharing of love that to me is energy healing. But when it's super focused and well-practiced, it can be a very transformative experience of being able to receive love in your emotions, in your spirit, in your mind, and in your physical body. And I have seen through through my practice of integrative energy healing, extremely miraculous physical things, manifestations, all, all sorts of things that people don't believe until they experience it. And that I would say comes from being in very, very deep presence where we can start to see ourselves differently, mm -hmm. see our reality differently than we, we believed it was before. Right. So when you're working with people, are you like the healer healing someone or is it more like physical things that you're teaching people to do to heal their energy? Or oh, both? That's a great question. Yeah. Well, I think it's a little bit of both. A lot of what I do now is I teach people how to facilitate as healers. Mm -hmm. And, and I think I also do a lot of big, uh, like online and in-person group healing sessions, but what I really try to emphasize is that I'm just a facilitator and a co-pilot. We heal ourselves. So uh, while extremely miraculous things have happened, like people healing diseases or, um, shrinking tumors or getting pregnant after years of not being able to like those kinds of things happening, what I find is it happens because they see themselves in that inner, more truthful soul space within them. And I, and I know that sounds like very like woo woo, <laughs> yeah. but like <laughs> my job as a facilitator is to guide someone to go into deeper states of awareness so that the things that they believed about themselves that are self-limiting, they can see differently. They can mm, free they themselves start to shift from. it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Do you find and, that? And it, that's what I'm passionate about. Yeah. Let's talk about like what exactly is shifting. Cause people are like, like, I mean, I've heard these stories. I do some, like I do a certain type of healing practice myself, but I think I, I want to see how you understand what is it that is shifting when people are healing on, on an emotional, spiritual and physical level. <laughs> Such a good question. I love yeah. your question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you ask that, the, the vision I got is like, there's a moment where I can see it on someone's face. Mm -hmm. There's a moment, and, and this to me, I mean, I just taught a big class in London uh, a week ago. And I, and I told some of the people that came, I said, those moments when someone is coming up and they're really going deep into a meditation and they, they feel an emotion or they have a memory or a thought that feels extremely uncomfortable. Like maybe it's a thought of, trauma, like an experience, they had a memory of trauma that they forgot about, or, or all of a sudden they, they feel like they can never get anything right. Whatever that is, it, it, we all have those things that really yeah. disturb us. And there's that moment where if you just stick with it, if you just bring your attention to that pain or that, that discomfort, instead of, instead of being like, Oh, I got to go back to work or, Oh, let me think about what I'm doing after this, but just breathe into it, then it starts to show you that it's an illusion, mm. that that's not real, that it's actually a pattern. It's a, it's a habit that someone taught you to think that you're never good enough or that you're not pretty enough or that that matters. And, it, and it's in these very, very delicate moments when you're becoming more present of your own mindset or your own worldview or identity of yourself. And so literally all I need is five minutes with someone 
and just I'm like just just let's push it a little further where you just wow. hold your attention on those moments. Sometimes it just feels weird. People say I, I, I don't know why, but I just felt weird all of a sudden. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's it's an emotion that's been suppressed for years. An emotion like anger, an emotion like fear that you haven't allowed yourself to feel that's now coming up to be seen. And you just let yourself see it, and then you realize the shift is you realize. Oh, oh my gosh, this is just an old program. This is an old belief. This is right. this is an illusion and it's not real. And once you get past that, you then get to come into Let that greater go. consciousness of what of what you decide is real, what you want to create. I love that. Thanks for answering that question. <laughs> I hope it, that made sense. No, it totally made sense. Um, yeah, because in my own personal experience of healing, doing breath work or, or other techniques like that, it always brings out certain memories that you forgot about. And it, it shows that those memories are deep into your subconscious. Ooh. So deep, yes. right? But the fact that it you can bring it up with these whatever practice you're doing, like that gives you a chance to be aware and then to to decide, do I want to keep this or do I want to let it go? Like, does it even make sense? Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. Um, another yeah. question I have for you is when pe- when that memory or that emotion comes up, how do you encourage people to let it go? Do you encourage them to just like talk about it or like scream? Some people scream, some people like release their emotions in different ways. So yeah. How do you guide someone through that once it's come up? Yeah. This is one of the reasons why I love to use uh, breath work with energy healing because the breath is one of the ways that our body literally releases what we don't need, mm-hmm. right? Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> so we're doing we it have, all day, every day. Yeah, exactly. And think about think about when you have like a really tense exchange and then you sigh. <sighs> That's the physical body's way of releasing tension. Mm, And so what I find is that we have, especially in our Western culture, we have a lot of ways of withholding, releasing. So like when I say we withhold, we, we don't, we're not allowed to cry at, at our job. We're not allowed to scream when we're mad, right? There's so many things. And some of these things make sense because it keeps us from like hurting ourselves and other people. I get it. But we do need to release anger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And anger is a valid emotion that actually helps us go up in our uh, emotional intelligence. It allows us to actually do things to help ourselves, right? If we, if we keep moving past things like revenge, we can get to, oh, you know, I'm angry. So instead of lashing out, I'm going to move out, right? So we can use these emotions, but often we suppress them. So mm-hmm. what I find is really helpful is breath work because we can release right then and there as we're feeling the tension and the energy of the things that we usually suppress. But another thing that I I really uh, make sure to encourage people to do is to cry because I don't think people realize how much, how many tears they are withholding, yeah. not realizing that tears isn't about being a baby. I mean, I cry all the time, so I feel like yeah. me and my friends totally get it. Yeah. <laughs> But, but a lot of times there's like a lot of spaces and places and people that we can't actually release tears with and in front of. And so we kind of do that even in our own private lives when tears are literally the body's way of releasing chemicals, hormones, stressor hormones that actually inflame our body and keep us in a state of stress. So So one of the things that I do a lot when we're in our breathwork sessions, I use music and a lot of prompts to say, let go of your tears. And sometimes people feel like they almost have to force them out. And I say, don't force them out. Just notice how much you're fighting your tears. And then what often happens is people will start to release it in other ways. People will laugh. People will start coughing. They'll start Um, shaking. But it's all the same to you, right? It's all a way to release. And it's all a release. I love it. So, so there's no judgment between like different types of release in your eyes. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's wow. exactly what I always say. There's no judgment. Sometimes people fart. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Just anyway, you let that energy out. I love like, good that. job. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I love that. Yeah, cry more if you feel it. Let it out. I'm all for that too because I'm a big crier, and I have a boyfriend who has not cried since he was a child. And he, he thinks it's normal. He thinks that he just doesn't have tear ducts. And I was like, no, you're blocked. Something's wrong. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like you and boyfriend need to come to my uh, next I, group session. You know what? I got we you. really should. Oh <laughs> I'm serious. I would love I, to have y'all. 
Yes, I would love to yeah. too. Okay, another question I have for you is some people believe in compartmentalizing your feelings. And I get it. Some so like sometimes it's necessary, right? If you're in a work situation or I don't know, there's sometimes in life there's these situations where people believe in, okay, like I, I can't show the feelings now. Let me put it somewhere and then release it later. Do you believe in that? Mm. Yeah, I think well, I think there's definitely a complex thought that comes with that for me. And it's that not everywhere is safe to be vulnerable. Like we have to remember that there are a lot of spaces and places and people that are not here to support and serve our healing or vulnerability. That doesn't mean that we're not authentic. Mm. So there's that, that's like a whole nother conversation, but it doesn't mean that we are always safe to bear our souls and, and be in our more vulnerable states with people in, in certain places. And so with, with that, I had to learn that the hard way because I used to think I could just bear my soul with anybody and everyone and really learned like a lot of people are so out of touch with their own emotions and their own experience that they can't even handle someone expressing their That's own true. authentic experience. Yeah. So we have to really be compassionate even for that. So mm-hmm. for me, one of the things that I do is I make sure to have a regular practice of releasing and processing my emotions mm-hmm. every single morning. And I do that with journaling or breath work and meditation so that I can get ahead of it so that I'm not out here in the world, a ticking time bomb about to cry if somebody tells me no. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. You're like, I did that already me. in the morning. <laughs> yeah, that used to be me. And I already yeah. did that. I'm like, I already yeah. cried in the bathtub, so I'm good. <laughs> You know, but, but, or, or that I've just processed enough on a regular basis that my, my, my window of tolerance, as they called in psychology is actually very open. I I can take a lot. It's when we have a lot of trauma and a lot of upset and a lot of unprocessed emotions that at any moment something happens, like someone cuts us off in traffic, we're done. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think the the answer that I would say is we have to or we have the opportunity to be preemptive in having a, a wider window of tolerance so that we can go to our therapists, our safe friends and family who can actually hold the space and who are ready to hold the space because it's important that we ask as mm-hmm. well. And and that we have our own personal practices which as adults is our responsibility to really have spaces to put this energy because talking about energy healing, when I work with people's energy who've had a lot of trauma or PTSD, really, really painful experiences, it's a heavy weight. It's, it's things that have been built up and compacted in their body Mm -hmm. and in their spirit for years. So we need to do the work to dismember and release and diffuse that energy. And that's going to be a daily practice. I see. That makes so much sense. Like is it's maintenance literally you, every day you have to take care of yourself release it so yeah because people do let it build up and that's usually when something triggers you and it's not even related like it's not even a big deal but it's usually it's not just the related tip. yeah <laughs> definitely and, uh, and that's something i want to jump in and say a little bit a little bit more like with compassion and just really reflect on is that you know i've i've worked with thousands of people all over the world thousands of people, both in person, one-on-one and in groups. And I don't think people know how common it is to have acute trauma in your life, whether it's in your childhood or these extreme experiences in our adulthood, like car accidents or, or, or forced migration. I mean, really serious stuff. I don't think a lot of people give themselves that credit that they've had PTSD or trauma because one of the ways that we deal with trauma is that we say that other people's trauma is worse than our own. So I hope anybody listening will just consider that it's very, very common. They say at least one in three Americans have had some form of big T trauma. I would say mm-hmm. m- probably more than more, that. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we think about these big T traumas, really tough things, a lot of Americans today are still not processing that with professional help or being in safe environments or even with the safe family members that wouldn't perpetuate that kind of harm. And so we really, I think as a culture, as a society globally, not just in the U.S., really need to be more aware of like our own individual trauma. And yes, people have had worse things happen to them, but we get to have that safe space in ourselves where we start to give some credit for the things that are really challenging and seek the support that we need. 
Yeah. Love that you brought it up. It's true. I, I think people do compare themselves and their trauma. And just because someone's situation might be worse than yours doesn't discredit what you've gone through. Like the emotions are still real. The experience is still real. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So I'm curious now to hear about your morning, evening, or weekly routines. Like what are the things that you do, <laughs> uh, you know, to take care of yourself? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I have to say living in LA is, I feel like has given me such a luxury. When I lived in New York, I definitely did not have the kind of space and time that I do now. I feel very lucky Mm -hmm. um, to be in a position where I work for myself and I can kind of create my own routine. And so I'm aware that not all of us have that. And I, and I also got to say, I didn't have that for most of my life. So now that I'm in this position, I think one of the things that I'm learning is that the things that are really deeply self-care on a regular basis that are like just that feel good. So happen to also be the things that move the needle in my career and Mm. in my, like my, my life in general. And so one of those things for me that I, I always say is like so pivotal is daily journaling. It's just so, so important for me to, I I like to overthink. I, I can be obsessive. I can, you know, being a child of uh, having experienced a lot of uh, childhood trauma, an adult that experienced a lot of childhood trauma, I, I have a lot of mechanisms that will try to obsess and work things out and fix things and be perfect. So I have to really be aware of those old patterns. And journaling for me is a way to kind of get all of that stuff out of my head and onto yeah. a page so I can look at it more clearly. Yeah. So morning pages is a really powerful tool. Um, I also feel like, you know, our physical bodies are in some ways like machines, like they just need certain things to work right. They have to release those like uh, stress or hormones. And for me, a good sweat is like Mm. just, I tried to negotiate on it and I realized (laughs) like, no girl, you got to sweat. You got to sweat. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Is this something you do every morning then? Yeah. So in one way or another- whether well, well, whether yeah. it's going out on a walk or basically a movement in some yeah, way yeah, is yeah. going to be like whether it's doing sit ups or stretching mm-hmm. or something, a run or a yoga class. Uh, I really got to move in the yeah. morning, and, and if I can't do a good sweat in the morning, I'll get it at some point in the day. And that's mm-hmm. been something that I've really like struggled with over the years because it was really about in the past it was about aesthetics, it was about looking a certain way as a model, and now it's about actually feeling better. And that's really Mm. something that I have to really be mindful of. Um, Also in the morning, I really cannot get on my phone until I've done my, my meditation and my journaling. Like it is just a non-negotiable. And the second I do, everything's out the window. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I agree with you completely on those habits. I'm not the best at following it, but I know like, this is what will be the best for me. (laughs) Yeah. If I can do that. Um, do you meditate before journaling or journaling before meditating? What's your preference? I, so I find one of the ways that has worked for me to meditate is to do it while I'm still in bed. So okay. before I open my eyes, when I when I first wake up, because I, I have girl, I have a crazy sleep routine, which <laughs> I'll have to send you my little PDF for that. Okay. But I I okay. have like little eye shades that I wear. And so when I wake up in the morning, my eyes are still covered. And before I like take them off, I think of everything that I'm grateful for. That's how I set the tone of my day. I think about how do I want to feel today? I really sit with that. I meditate. I do a few different uh, breathwork practices and energy healing on myself. And then I get out of bed. So that way it's done. And then how long do you spend doing that? Oh, it depends, but I would say at least five minutes. I mean, and sometimes okay, it can be okay. 20, but at yeah. least five minutes. I yeah. see. Because I do you tend to, like, once you start meditating, do you tend to want to, like, keep going and it can last, like, an hour? Are you like yeah, that sometimes? sometimes I go back to sleep. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sure most people would sleep after that. <laughs> sometimes I'm like, maybe I don't have to get up. Yeah. No, I mean, I definitely, I definitely can get into a really deep zone with it and I, I have to say something that's been coming to me a lot lately is that I could afford to meditate even more during the day. And so that's something that I'm going to start to to really practice. Mm-hmm. Love it. Love it. Okay. So how do you recommend our listeners who are curious about everything you do, how do you recommend them getting started with energy healing or breath work? Ooh, that's a great question. Well, I really 
I recommend breath work uh, to start because everybody can do it. If you're alive, mm-hmm. you can breathe. Right. So um, even if you have even if you have any health problems um, that make it hard to breathe, what I find with breath work, whether you come and try it with me, which I would love for anybody to come visit me, we have a monthly energy healing and breath work session that we do every first Saturday. That's really powerful called TMI. So that's one way I would recommend it. But even just having a different pattern of breath for just a couple of breaths, it helps you to disrupt your subconscious patterns. Mm -hmm. So even if you just sit down for a moment, close your eyes, breathe in through your mouth, breathe into your lower belly, and then into your heart, and exhale out, and you do that three times. That will help you to be more mindful before you go into a meeting, before you have a hard conversation, before you have an interview. So it's little things like that that can prime you. And if you don't come and do like an hour of breath work with me, one of the things that I also really recommend for people to get started is to start to notice what they are thinking when they're in their day-to-day experience. So one of the things that's really potent about breath work and energy healing is that it can help bring you into a deep state of presence. So to be really, really present is to not be thinking about other things or what happened in the past. It's to be like totally with what is happening right now, which typically you're safe and everything is fine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so what I find can be really helpful to just literally ask yourself throughout your day, what am I thinking right now? Mm. And you can even put it as like a reminder on your your like phone to pop up and ask yourself and just sit for a second and just be like, what am I thinking right now? And just notice your thoughts. And that little practice will start to help you be more mindful and start to notice how your energy can be up and down on a roller coaster and how it's tied to your thoughts. Yeah. Love it. And then just to clarify, the way you breathe for breathwork breath work is two breaths in through the nose or through the mouth. Yes, and then through the, the mouth, mouth, through the mouth. So one of the things So what's the really- difference between nose and mouth? Because I know in yoga, it's all like in through the nose, out through the mouth. There's Usually, different types of breathing, right? Yeah, definitely. So maybe explain that. Well, what I find with um, breathing through the nose is that you're bringing in a lot more oxygen when you're breathing in through the open mouth. And actually, Mm -hmm. it's better for our health that we typically breathe through the nose. So I just want to like note that, that this is like for a practice purpose. And so one of the reasons why we want to oxygenate our blood is because, I mean, oxygenate our bodies is because we're oxygenating our blood. And when we oxygenate our blood, it actually gives us access to our to new uh, areas of our brain. So from a science perspective, you're literally oxygenating your brain blood cells, which allow you to go further back into your unconscious uh, thoughts. Uh-huh. So that's why when you go running for a while and you have those like realizations, it's because you've oxygenated your blood and you're literally having more access to the thoughts in your brain and your memories and your, your, your your patterns. So when we breathe through the mouth, we're literally doing that at a faster pace, but this breath work, it, it is very important that we do it through our mouth. But what I find also is that a lot of us are breathing just in our chest, which is at our flight fight or flight response. So when we get triggered, when we're scared, when we're stressed, which a lot of us are a lot of the time, we tend to only breathe from up in our chest, which is signaling our brain, hey, we're not safe. Hey, we got to run. Hey, something's not right. So when we start to consciously breathe into our lower belly, that starts to signal to our body and our brain that we're in a uh, rest and digest stage. So when we go into a rest and digest, we start to breathe deeper into our belly and that allows our body to start to relax and be more receptive to new ideas, um, to releasing our toxic um, stressor hormones. So it kind of resets our body. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, And then I, I know that you're launching a new course, right? Soon. I think it'll be out by the time this episode is out. I just want to give you an opportunity to talk about that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, well, there's there's two. Um, we actually have um, a training coming up in Los Angeles for anyone okay. who's interested in really diving deep into breathwork and energy healing. It is a four-day, completely immersive practice with me to learn how to facilitate. And you do that by actually experiencing the breath work that I'm talking about for about an hour and a half every day. Mm. It is 
a very deep dive. <laughs> right. Wait, I mean, how many days are you doing this? Uh, Every day? Four days in a row. Oh, four days in a row. Of four days work. in a row. Yeah. yeah. And um, we actually have one in Spain, but it's been sold out. So this will be the next one in Los Angeles if anybody uh, is interested in that. And then we'll be doing one online at the end of the year. But I also have something called Thriving and Aligned. And this is really my response to all of the healers, all of the facilitators and like seekers out there who have said, hey, I want to have a business as a healer. How did you do that? Mm-hmm. This is my response. Like, Love oh, it. actually, most of it's not about marketing or social media. 99% of how I got to this place as a healer to facilitate for so many was because of my own personal beliefs energies and programming around my healing and how I can support others. And so this program is just for that. Okay. That's huge. I want to hear a little bit more about that shift because all, I I know there's a ton of these courses. There's a lot of like, you know, people trying to do coaching or healing and they do talk about marketing, right? Getting yourself out there, being seen, which I'm sure is part of it. But so what is it that you're saying is more important? (laughs) Yeah. I was like, there are a lot of coaching programs out there that tell you about how to do like a media marketing mix and all of that stuff. That's Mm. not me. That's not Mm -hmm. how we, how we have done it. What I realized is every time I had a major event in my personal life where I healed something, a belief, an experience that was really challenging, when I really face it and really look at all the deeper implications about how I identify myself in the world, my business takes off. That's just like, that's what happens. It like is directly linked. And I think one of the reasons why is because a lot of my business is related to my life. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people will keep it totally separate. And what we find even with my clients who, you know, are, who are doctors and actors and, you know, doing everyday jobs that are, are in between, I find that a lot of my clients start to see that too, that, wow, the more that I start to heal some of those things that I rather ignore Mm -hmm. and I start to look at what did my mom and dad teach me about success? What did my parents teach me was okay for me to be seen? How did they teach me to, um, to believe in myself or not? When we start to look at those things, what I see with my clients and my, my teacher students is that their whole life starts to shift because the things that they thought were normal, they actually can make a new choice on and then their life responds. Love it. Love it. I think that isn't talked about enough, how much your healing and just all of those invisible things like attribute to success. Because I noticed that in my own journey too. The more I've healed, the more I've let go, the more I can be more authentic and confident. And like, instead of walking, for example, if I have, I, I had a sh- big shoot this week, it, like walking into set that normally would have been like so nerve wracking. I would have been so anxious and I would care about, oh, do I look good? Am I doing well? Like all of these thoughts that come from a deeper trauma, like now I can do these same things with confidence and I can, I just, I'm more free. And like, I think you're better when you're more free and you've let go of yes. these, these worries and these anxieties. So yes, and it, more magnetic yeah, too. Exactly. Like people are like, "Ooh, what is it?" I mean, yeah. I have to say, from looking at you on your YouTube channel, like really kind of just like checking you out, I was like, "Yeah, she feels like a real one. She's oh, definitely like just being herself." And I really appreciate <laughs> trying, that because yeah. the world needs more of that. Yeah, but also that's what is more attractive. That's what mm-hmm. magnetizes people to you. So I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, love it. Do you have any last pieces of advice for our listeners in their healing journey? Mm, Let's see. I would say I would really love to just invite you all to try breath work and energy healing at some point, whether it's with me or anyone else, because I think the more that we start to have the opportunities to look at our fears and our insecurities and see that they're not real, that they're an illusion, the more empowered, the more healthy and happy we get to be in this life. And so I just hope that whether it's with me or anyone else that you'll try to explore some practices that will take you into those deeper states where you can be fearless and really look at yourself and really ask yourself, who am I and who do I want to be? Yeah. And and that that's something I would love to 
to support anybody that's open and ready to do. Love it. Thank you so much, Milana. I had such a great time speaking with you. Such a great conversation. Um, everybody, make sure you check her out. All links are down below. Where, where can we find you online? Let's plug that. Oh, yeah. Yes. So um, please visit me at milanasnow.com. That's M-I-L-L-A-N-A-S-N-O-W. And I'm also on Instagram. All of the links are there. We have our monthly energy healing and breath work on um, our TMI membership. And that's at milanasnow.com too. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you.